Hello everyone, welcome to Voices of the Vessel. I'm Shelby, the Director of Marketing for the Badger, the Lake Michigan Car Ferry. This podcast is dedicated to highlighting the people and voices from over the years who have made the Badger what she is today, as she is celebrating 70 years of service. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Pier Ludington and Visit Manitowoc, our wonderful port cities. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm really excited for today's episode as it's slightly different from some of the other episodes that we've done so far and a topic that I am really interested to learn more about and you all get to learn with me about the Kallenberg horn and how it has played a role in the Badger and in the community of Two Rivers, Wisconsin, which is right next to Manitowoc. And so a lot of maritime history in that area. And today I am very honored to have joining us Eric Collenberg. Hi, Shelby. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining us today. That um, Tell us a little bit more about you. Uh, let's see. Um, I've actually been here for 30 years this year. Oh, good for you. So I, yeah, I, um, after, after graduating college, I had worked at a couple other jobs for about two years. And, um, my father had worked here at the time and my uncle. And at that point they started looking to see if a third generation was interested in, uh, or fourth generation, sorry, I should know what generation I am. Fourth generation <laughs> interested in working in the business. So they made a few calls and I was interested. I was actually working in Sheboygan at the time, so I wasn't too far away. So I started in 92, um, end of 92. So um, it's I've been here a long time. I'm, I'm vice president vice president now, um, mostly in charge of um, engineering and quality control and to a large extent marketing. Um, so this awesome. is a good opportunity for us to talk a little bit about what we do. Awesome. Well, congratulations to you and how cool to join the family business that did you go to school for engineering or I didn't. Um, I grew up uh, in my dad's workshop for the most part. He was chief engineer here before I was here. Okay. And um, when I came here, I had no intention of of being in engineering at all. Um, I was actually hired in sales. So oh, gotcha. it's not a very big company. You know, we only have I mean, we've got 28 people right now. And it was about nice. the same when I got here. So um, when I first started, it was really learning the sales role. And what became apparent kind of quickly was that <clears throat> my dad had actually passed away a couple months before I started. So oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. So when I got here, there was kind of a gap, um, especially with regard to IT. Mm-hmm. They were moving into, you know, computerizing everything as far as the ERP system for the office and CNC machine tools and all that. And some of the staff were older and it was it was kind of a difficult um, transition. And what I kind of noticed early on was that when I got here, it was really just about kind of filling gaps. It's like Mm. certain things kind of needed to be done. And I just sort of applied myself wherever I thought um, I needed to. So uh, I started actually at the same time as my cousin, Steve, who is president of the company. And the two of us just kind of, you know, divided up the things that needed to be done. He actually was hired in the engineering role. And, um, you know, we started moving forward. And, And really the the IT thing was was a, a big deal then. I mean, it was 1992, and oh, for um, sure, everything here was still being done on paper, and it was wow, yeah. You know, talk about the tech boom, and that is a yeah. lot of transition all at one time. But but good on you guys that you you know obviously the family business and keeping it in the family, but having a moment to say, okay, these are where the gaps are. How can we improve and make it work? And I mean, here you are, 30 years later. Yeah, I mean, it was a really good foundation to start with. I mean, it's always been a very solid brand and it was well engineered. And, um, and uh, you know, they were doing trade shows and they were marketing reasonably well. It just, you know, there were, it, it gets to a point, I think, with each generation where you're sort of a, you're kind of a caretaker here. And mm-hmm. I think that, you know, you get, you know, they, they were probably, you know, at an age where they were, you know, they were starting to look forward to retirement and they were looking for, sure. for, you know, some new energy to come in and kind of take care of it. So that was, that was their plan. No, oh, how, well, that's awesome that it worked the way it did. Yeah. And what a brand you guys have that you guys have quite the storied history of how you began and some of the engines, if you don't mind talking about, you know, 
what have you guys made over the years? Right. Um, well, it started out really with steam engines. Um, and before that, it was, it was to some extent hardware. You know, we still mm-hmm. have the original um, ledger from 1895 when the business was started. And if you go wow. back and you look at the, yeah, you go back to the first That's entries. That's so cool. Yeah, they were selling, I mean, they were selling everything from um, steam engines and steam engine parts to just hardware for other things. My great, great grandfather had a hardware store in True Rivers. So mm. Kallenberg engines were kind of born out of that. My great grandfather grew up in that hardware store. And wow. the, the engines mm. kind of took over and he actually employed his father for a while. <laughs> wow. When they started building engines. <laughs> Yeah, that's, so that's really neat. That was a start, I guess. And then how did it kind of transform into air horns? Um, well, it, it I wouldn't say it was as much a transformation. It just the engine business um, was really everything. The vast majority of sales for a long time mm-hmm. um, until um, about 19 until after World War Two. Um, World yeah. War II was probably the busiest time and when the company was the largest because they had a, a contract with um, the U.S. Army for transport vessels. So they sold a lot of Kallenberg engines um, for the war effort. And um, in 19, uh, let's see, it was actually 1929, I think the, you know, you really can't say it was the Great Depression yet, but um, the first air horn record is 1929 when my um, great uncle Roger um, invented that. And I'm not sure, you know, I've kind of looked around, we have a few competitors that are still around that have been around since that point in time. And they're all Mm -hmm. um, overseas for the most part, but I've tried to figure out, you know, like who was the first one. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I know we were the first ones on this continent, but, um, I thought it started in the thirties, but it was actually 1929. I discovered that recently because Art Chavez was asking me, specifically you know can you go back and look at when the first air horn record was but i think to some extent it was just um my great grand or my great grandfather at the time um in let's see in 1929 he would have very he would have been very active i think as the head of the company in terms of engineering engines and i wonder if maybe my great uncle you know his son kind of just thought well you know, there's an opportunity to do something else here besides that. Let's, you know, let's do mm-hmm. the air horn. And that actually is now um, the the majority of our business is really is really signaling sales, it's still mostly for marine and also for industrial and some wide area warning and other purposes. So that's amazing. And talk about innovation, but just seeing the need for something that you guys have really stood the test of time. That's really amazing to think of yeah. just the change over time in so has two rivers always been the company's home base it has yeah um my great great grandfather emigrated here and then great grandfather started Kallenberg brothers company which became Kallenberg industries in 2010 but it, it's always been it's always been here um I don't think there was ever any idea of having it be someplace else. The the engines really mm-hmm. developed around the marine industry, which was really very yeah. prevalent, you know, here back at that, you know, period in time. And a, a lot of these engines got sold for the fishing fleets across the yeah. Great Lakes. So it was kind of a good home market. The location really made a lot of sense at that point in time. And now it's kind of you wonder like, okay, why is this in two rivers and they're making boat yeah. horns? And, you know, most of them get exported to a ocean coast somewhere for sure Um, so so maybe the location doesn't seem as sensible as it did but it's always been here well and you mentioned art chavez that i mean i have to give him a shout out to that he kind of introduced us and kind of got my wheels turning of how interesting this but i didn't know until recently that this was in two rivers um wisconsin that i'm from the michigan side and i love the michigan side but it's so interesting when you talk about the history of the car ferries and the badger specifically that she was built in sturgeon bay um at the what was the christie corporation and she's had a lot of ties obviously today we sail into manitowoc but even manitowoc shipbuilding that kind of makes sense when you think about that history of all these shipbuilding and where they were built that how neat that you kind of get to be your standalone business and still be in operation today i find that so fascinating yeah it's it's a long time most family businesses don't don't survive 
this long. <laughs> yeah, but that's something definitely to be a proud of. And even when in some of my research and what Art has said, you guys have been associated with multiple variety of boats over the years. You mentioned fishing boats, um, but you're, you have the Badger steam whistle even and everything that, what other yeah. boats have you been associated with? Well, as far as the, I mean, if you want to start with the ferries, I mean, all of them that were built in this vintage. Um, so it would be city of Midland, I think, and Spartan mm -hmm. and Badger. Those are all, um, those are all the same horn, actually. They were all designed yeah. for that, for the car ferries. Um, so there's that. I mean, that's probably the most significant local connection. Um, the Ranger 3, which um, oh, runs mm -hmm. up to Apostle Islands. That's that. Mm, no, that's not right. It's up in the UP, and I am familiar with it. Yeah. I apologize. That's I can't think of the city myself. Anyway. But it is a boat similar to the Badger, but a little bit smaller, I believe. Yeah, smaller. Um, but our horns are on there. I mean, basically, any any boat that's really significant, of significant size, it's a commercial vessel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so many of them that have our horns on them. I mean, whether just in this country or internationally, um, we sell an awful lot of um, horns to a very niche market, which is really the large yacht market. Yeah. And most of those are most of those are built in um, Northern Europe and Turkey and Italy, um, and then in Asia too. So, and, and we we export quite a few of the commercial um, horns too. So. Gosh, I mean, as far as specific boats go, there's a there's a lot of names, but um, it covers yeah. it covers a lot. I mean, we sell to over 30 countries a year, and that's pretty much all marine related business for the horns. And just think of like little Two Rivers, Wisconsin, making a footprint in over 30 countries. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. And it really, you know, it's funny. I know a lot of people don't know we're here. <laughs> yeah. And I was actually looking you up on Google maps this morning and I've driven by you guys multiple times and I kind of feel bad that I had no idea. <laughs> right. No, that's okay. And and really it's just, it kind of makes sense because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if we're, if our, if our primary business is really um, with customers that are a long way away from here, you probably don't hear a lot about it right here. Yeah. You know, it's like, more for, you're more likely to be in New Orleans and mention a Columbia horn and have somebody go, oh, I know exactly what that is. You know what I mean? Right. Versus, versus here, because their river traffic is just, you constantly hear them. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Well, I think that's just so fascinating. And especially on the Badger, I get questions about the horn all the time. And I try to, I mean, I love history and I try to know a lot of these facts that I had no idea it was built right into rivers, that it's a beautiful community, great place that to me, it makes sense now, but wow, what a neat little thing that you guys have. Yeah. And you talked about it a little bit, but you guys have been known for a lot of different accessories over time as well, not just the engines or steam horns or whistles. Yeah. I mean, most significantly what we make now is, you know, the horns. Um, we also make marine propellers. Um, that's a very niche market too. We make uh, stainless steel propellers up to about 10 feet in diameter that go on wow. mostly inland river push boats. I mean, the primary application is all is, is, you know, the boats that are pushing barges up and down our mm -hmm. inland rivers. So that's a big part of the business too. And that's been around since that's been around longer than the air horns. Um, wow, because that's we used to, fascinating. Uh, we used to make propellers and the shaft lines and, mm -hmm. and transmissions and everything for the engines that were sold. So, Makes you know, perfect you, sense. back in the day, it's hard to, you know, if you were finding a marine engine, it's like, okay, now I've got to find a propeller and a boat shaft. Mm -hmm. and you know, Kind of like sure a one-stop shop in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but over the years, there have been other things. Um I mean, I've gone back through our prints. I've seen, you know, windshield wipers for boats. I'm not sure exactly how that one lasted. That was gone before <laughs> I got here. Um, but worth a try. Do, That's cool. Yeah, right. Um, we do. Uh, the, the steam whistles are kind of interesting. I'm trying to figure exactly. I'm trying to figure out exactly. And I'm talking about steam whistle versus air horn. The steam whistles yes. are more of a, a cylindrical type thing like you would see on the Titanic or whatever. They're, mm -hmm. you know, tall and cylindrical. And we had them on lake boats before we had air horns. But I don't think we really made them back at that point in time. I think that we distributed them and another company made some. Mm. And then we started making them again in the 
in the early 80s just because the company that had been making them stopped. Um, and we still make those. Um, there have been other things like um, shaft seals, and we do make, we still make propeller shafts, generally larger propeller shafts. We fit, um, we'll fit the, the prop and the, and we'll make the shaft for, um, well, for burger boats locally and for other yeah. yards that are not too distant from us besides the horns. Um, I think that's about it. I mean, there's, there's, there have been other things, um, seals for rudders. We did make rudders themselves for mine sweepers at one time. That's um, cool. Been a, yeah, there's been a variety and we still have, the thing is we have, we have a pretty versatile shop in terms of machining. And so mm -hmm. there's, there's a fair amount of business that we do for other companies where we're just making, you know, component parts um, to other people's designs because we have the capability to do that. So, um, so sometimes we have people that do come along with product ideas and, and we make them. We've recently been making some, um, some stainless steel, uh, video cameras for yeah, oh, which are like, a, yeah, it's like a stainless steel, um, it's hard to describe, but it's like a spherical stainless steel housing for a small security mm -hmm. camera, but we've done some of those recently. Um, so you kind of never know what might come Yeah. Along. Well, it sounds yeah. like business is good and that you're always, you know, innovating and updating that that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Things are going well. I'm so glad to hear that. And especially when talking about the future one, not to take a step back into the past, but it sounds like Kallenberg really made a lot of aid in the war effort as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, I mean, there were a lot of horns sold, a lot of engines, um, and primarily, like I said, I think earlier that transport vessel for the army, and I'm not going to remember the number on it, and somebody that listens to the podcast will probably know, <laughs> but um, we, did, um, we, we did win the, um, um, the E award, it's just excellence in wartime production, and so That's we've amazing. got photos of of that and 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 so that was that was a big deal that was a very busy time for the company um i remember um the daughter one of the daughters of uh, roger kallenberg had told me that you know during that time like during the war she just never saw her dad like he was always oh i here. can imagine yeah you know it was so busy and um she said that he would always make time you know like on a sunday afternoon they would take a drive in the car out in the country and that was like the only time she saw him for a, oh, wow. for quite a while, I think. Yeah, because I think he was gone before she got up in the morning and he was probably home after she went to bed. So I can't imagine, but it was, you know, there was there was a lot of work done during that period. Well, I, and I can imagine, but how, I mean, I've said it, I know I've said it before and I'll probably say it again, of like, what a way of standing the test of time. That's amazing. In my research, I read a quote that says, today the Kallenberg air horn is synonymous with quality and is widely used. What does that mean to you? That's quite the quote. Um, I think that, that the culture for making something that's very high quality was, that was, you know, that was probably the reason for the success from the start. And I think because we're a small family owned company vision for the future, that's more longer term, you know, we're yeah. not a corporate, we're not a public company. We don't answer the shareholders on a quarterly basis to say, you know, why didn't we raise profits this quarter? There's not, there's mm -hmm. not a constant demand to try to crush, you know, cost out of the product, sacrificing quality in the process. For so, sure. so I think that for us, it's really, um, I mean, it's kind of what we put first. Um, and then, you know, obviously we have to produce something that's, you know, at a, you know, that's cost effective. Um, mm -hmm. But we look at it as trying to produce something that's got a low cost of use over time, you know, which means it's more durable. It lasts longer. You don't have to repair it as often. And I think testing to that, you know, it's like a situation like the Badger where you've got, you know, a horn that's been on yeah. there since it was built. And, they may have invested up to a hundred dollars in that horn. <laughs> so <you> just <laughs> new yeah. diagrams that go in it, but not much. So they last a long time. And um, that's, that's, I think that's, it's still, you know, the most important thing for us is maintaining that level of quality. Cause that's a reputation that you can, it takes a long time to gain it and you can lose it very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was kind of, 
going into one of my next questions is that the horn on the badger is a Kallenberg. And is it normal to see these horns still in use after 70 years? Um, 70 years is a long time. Most boats don't last 70 years, which right. is probably, you know, I mean, I've had, I will still get calls from people that have horns that were built before this one. Um, and they'll, you know, they'll call and they'll need, we, there's, there's like one operating part in most of these things. And it's essentially just a, a flat piece of bronze and they, you know, they'll come and order that, which is, I don't know, maybe $40 a piece on a horn like this. And some of them are older than this one, but it's usually the boat gets scrapped and the yeah. horn is still on it. It's still functioning and somebody takes a horn off and maybe they use it somewhere else or somebody buys mm -hmm. it, you know, scrap just for fun. But we do see a lot of older boats that last in the Great Lakes because obviously yeah. it's fresh water. Right. So, for sure. You know, when I see our really old horns, they're usually on some of these fish tugs that are mm. older than the badger. Um, yeah. <laughs> some of them. There are a few. <laughs> yep. And those still have our horns on them. But that's I think that's where you really see the, the oldest ones. But it's I wouldn't say it's uncommon um, to have them that's last amazing. that long. No, oh, what a great testament to your product. And um, because the badger horn is really synonymous for the sound of summer for both the Ludington and Manitowoc communities. Like, how does that feel? Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I mean, I, you know, I'm um, I, I live inland a little bit and I I, I make an effort to drive um through Manitowoc <laughs> sometimes when I know the, the badger's coming in just to watch it and hear it. And um, yeah, because so it really is an lot. iconic feature of the ship. I mean, so we yeah. actually have it. I don't know if you knew this as a download on our website um, that people oh, cool. can have it is like a ringtone. Um, and even, yeah. you know, as folks were tuning into this podcast, it, it's the opening sound of a lot of our audio marketing, um, okay. our TV commercials, the podcast, you can hear it pretty much anywhere that um, and we hear it time and time again, you know, when our season starts in mid May, people are like I've been waiting all winter to hear that horn. Um, welcome yeah. the boat into port. Yeah, it's it's actually a unique sound. There's there mm -hmm. really aren't any others out there anymore that that sound like that. They changed exactly. the rules for the frequencies that you had to use to make horns for certain size boats in the 80s. And so a lot of the designs changed a little bit. So some of these oh, super low sounds mm -hmm. are really that sound really great. You don't hear as often anymore unless they're really huge ships. Oh, I didn't realize that. And it's interesting too, um, growing up in Ludington back in the thirties, Ludington was the largest car ferry port in the world. And it was common, you know, just the different um, master salutes or horns sounds that they would give off that I've had um, on the podcast, for example, Audrey Robertson Bowles, whose father was the original captain of the Badger. And she knew um, when she heard the Badger's horn that she had 30 minutes to pick up all of her toys and get her room clean because she knew her dad would be home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so that sound has really meant so much to both communities. And I don't know if you are aware, but our, so the Ludington football team has the horn from the city of Midland and then the Manitowoc, I believe it's the Lincoln ships. Um, they have a horn that they use for, I believe theirs is a recording where the Ludington, so. they have the actual city of Midland horn that they use to sound off for like touchdowns yeah. and stuff. And that thing, that horn is massive. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's and, a lot of sound for high school football team. Right. Well, and I, I think it goes back to the community ties. But um, sure. last year, actually, it was funny. Some people hurt the Ludington football team was getting it out to like warm it up or practice, make sure it was still working well. And it was going off at like three o'clock in the afternoon. I had like people calling me saying, hey, why do I hear the badger horn right now? Something wrong. Yeah. Like it didn't sound correct. So they kind of knew that it was like not the badger horn, but thought it was and like, that's yeah. not the right time of day. So it really has become that iconic thing. But how neat that it's kind of transferred over from the ships into other community adventure adventures in a way. Yeah, we sell a surprising number of horns actually for um, sports facilities, um, high school yeah. football teams and NHL and 
and all of that because it's i mean if you didn't know i mean this is another no i don't know it's a technical thing but no, i love it loud sounds loud sounds like that actually give you a jolt of adrenaline so mm. that's kind of why yeah you know no, that makes are, sense I mean, good, good warning device right but that's why they use them in in sports venues too because it just kind of i think it charges up the crowd and for sure um, that makes well and it sounds like i mean like nhl teams sporting teams like yachts people can find them really in a lot of different facets of life that in some of my research like you guys were making horns specific for the orange bowl yeah that one um that one i'm not sure about we do have mm-hmm. um let's see i want to say that as far as NHL or us uh, nfl teams go i know buffalo has one i know san francisco has one um but the orange bowl i don't i don't know if i even have it on a list so that one's almost that one's news to me that may well, be a long time ago though i'm not sure yeah. that might be one of my i will send you the research that i found on that okay <laughs> well and i just think it's what a neat story of you know being multi-purpose in a way if you will for a lack of better terms of you know it can yeah. be on a ship and then it can be on a football field and I get so many people like now that I think about it and just talking with you, like people, one of my favorite, um, I give presentations to second graders and it's always fun to hear because kids are so fascinated by the boat. And I actually had um, a little girl ask me, why is the horn so loud? It's something that, you know, I don't know if it's because I'm so inundated with it, but it's like, that's a really good valid question, especially for a kid of that's what they're meant to do. Like be loud is the easy answer, but to right. you know, be the warning signal. So that's how they were meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. Big ships take a long time to stop. So yeah. you need to know as far in advance that one <laughs> your way as possible, I think. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people just aren't aware about that. And um, it's just so fascinating to see how many people, I think, but I think you really hit the nail on the head when you say it's synonymous with adrenaline, um, that it's always fun to see people get really excited on board. And uh, yeah. I'll never forget, I mean, I've been on board multiple times and there's like kids standing underneath the horn. Like our, our captains do a good job of like, if they see parents out on the bow of like, hey, the, like the, we're going to blow the yeah. horn. Um, but there was one time I was standing underneath there talking to some parents and this little boy, he was maybe three, four years old and the horn goes off and he tenses up and it's like, and I'm part of me is like, okay, here we go. He's going to like start crying or something. If he just gets this look on his face, he goes, that was awesome. Like, <laughs> like, okay. I wish I could have recorded that. And it's like, people <laughs> love it. People are always excited to hear it. And, um, that it just sounds like you guys have an amazing thing going with an amazing company and an amazing product that what is your operation like today? I mean, obviously we've talked a lot about innovation and how things have changed, but I'm assuming yeah. like, and you said you have about 28 employees, like yes. talking about, you know, all over the country, 30 countries worldwide, like that's impressive in, in, it's not in, in, in and of itself, yeah. but especially with 20 I mean, employees. Yeah, it's still a small company, which makes the international part of it a little bit more difficult because it's, you know, to some extent, you know, it's expensive to try to cover that much scope, um, mm-hmm. you know, just geographically when you're not that big. And there are a lot of regulations yeah. and there are different different places um, that we have to meet. But as far as like how things are done, it's changed a lot and designs have changed a lot, too. So. I can imagine. You know, even though the, even though the, I mean, a, you know, a horn is a pretty mature product. It's not that there aren't that many companies around the world that we compete with for this same type of business for these big ships. Um, but how you make things has changed so dramatically since I've been here. Um, oh, I can from, imagine. You know, AutoCAD and. Um, and just, just the internet the, in general. Too. 3D printing. I mean, we have a yeah. large form. 3D printer that prints our propeller patterns. And we've got, there's a lot that's, that's changed um, as far as how the product is made, but I don't think the, you know, the, the philosophy has really changed as far as, you know, what we try to do, you know, really well. Um, And really where we're selling to hasn't changed that much. 
Um, it's just inside the plant. It's kind of interesting because, you know, you walk yeah. in the front door and it looks like 1907 other than <laughs> the computers on the desks, you know, yeah, and then, that's cool. you know, you walk through the plant through additions that were like the 1920s and the 1940s. And then 2000 is kind of the last addition to the plant. But as you go through what you're seeing is, I mean, there are remnants of old things. We still have a, a belt line that used to drive the machine tools on the floor, which is on the ceiling. It's these massive wooden pulleys, you know, that oh, are wow. on a shaft. Yeah, hanging above the office in our in our um, in our shop, but they've never been taken down because we've never had to put anything else yeah. there. But then, you know, there are modern machine tools, and you know, things are done much differently mm-hmm. on the floor, but. Um, but we try to do it. We try to do a good job to keep the building itself, you oh, know, for sure. sort of in, in the period, the offices, and I, you oh, know, if you so get a cool. chance to visit, that, that would be. I would that love would to. Fun. That'd be amazing. And I actually have a design background myself that I never would have thought. Like having a three D printer to kind of probably prototype and kind of get things going, and yeah. um, in something that I eventually would like to include in a podcast that um talking about like shipbuilding and model building and i never would have thought that would make perfect sense for what you're doing and um yeah just the details that is a lot of those little details that people probably don't think about but really at the end it adds to that quality of product that we're talking about right keeps us going keeps us yeah keeps us competitive in the 21st century <laughs> No, that's perfect. And I know we talked about it a little bit, but you guys also, you know, made the horns for like the other car ferry fleet. And was that more so just, you mm-hmm. think, because it was local, because it was there? Um, you know, I, back at that point in time, you know, if you were if you were looking for a larger ship horn, there were only a couple companies in the United States um, that produced something like that. Um and, you know, especially 1940. Um, so right. like Finland is 41, right? So that was built in 1941 so, or launched in 41. Yeah. The Badger was built and launched in 19, well, she was built in 52 and launched in 1953. Right. But the city of Midland is the first, I think, mm-hmm. and the oldest. And that one, you know, we sold a horn to in 1940. How cool. So, yeah. <laughs> so that was, so that was the first one that, that had it. Um, but how neat. Yeah. And then I also heard a little tidbit that you did some research on the Titanic horns. Yeah. Okay. In, uh, in 1999, um, I got a call just out of the blue from the person that was in charge of exhibiting the Titanic artifacts in Minneapolis at the time. They had, you know, if you remember, they had the Titanic sort of touring exhibit. Yeah. And um, they had the whistle and and somebody who was in their marketing department thought it would be a really cool idea to be able to sound the Titanic whistle again. You know, it had never wow. been heard, you know, since the ship left port and then sank. So anyway, they wanted to turn, they wanted to determine if it could be um, used again, if they could sound it off and what it would take. And, and so I gave them some information and we were, you know, really one of the few companies that dealt with steam whistles or air whistles. Of right. That design anymore. So, um, we went to Minneapolis and we, um, we went to a company that had it, uh, x-ray scanned so you could sort of see the interior of it and what was broken and parts of it were damaged that were, you know, imploded at that depth, oh, but yeah, but it sense. still, it still worked. Um, and we brought it back here and essentially sort of, um, cleaned it out and then started you know, started putting air to it at low pressures until, you know, we were confident that everything was, was solid. And and the people from Titanic were here and the people from the company that was actually running the exhibit in Minneapolis. But um, we, at, at one point, we actually did put all three of those whistles together and sound them off in our test chamber. And they don't, on air, um, whistles have a higher pitch than they do on steam. Scratch that lower pitch than they do on steam, but it has to do with density wow. of air. Anyway, so my point is we didn't really hear exactly what the Titanic would have sounded like because we weren't running it on steam. Yeah. But we were it on air, and we have, I don't know, we've got four or five enormous air tanks under the floor that are here that used to be used for starting engines when they tested engines back in oh, the day. Oh, neat. Yeah. And we pulled the lever on that 
on that whistle and it essentially consumed all the air we had in the building in about, <laughs> about a second and a half. Wow. Oh, that's so it was, amazing. I mean, it was really exciting, I think, for the people that were here. And then they did take it to um, St. Paul and they set it up uh, at the railroad or at the old terminal building, I guess they call it right in downtown and they set it off. And there were a lot of people. I don't remember the size of the crowd. I don't know if it, I don't remember if it was mm -hmm. 10,000 people. I don't remember, but it was a lot of people and they had two giant air compressors on trucks underneath the building and these huge hoses running wow. up to the steam whistle and they set it off and it was, it was okay. I think it could have been, they could have done it at a higher pressure, but they were, you know, they were a little concerned about destroying a Oh, for sure. <laughs> Which makes but sense. Talk about being a part of something so iconic. Like, it's not every day you probably get a call from, like, the Titanic and ask right. to be a part of this. That's amazing. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Well, I kind of pushed a little bit. I sent them a letter telling them all the things that we could do that were... No, good for you, know, you though. Like and they, um, and they, you know, luckily they came back and said, sure. It was just, it was, it was unusual. They, you know, when they finally said, yeah, you can, you know, come and look at the whistle and you can, then you can take it back to your shop. I went over there with, you know, Zach Nicolai in our office, one of the engineers, and we went to um, St. Paul and we drove it back here in the back of an unmarked panel van in an ice storm. And I just kept thinking the whole way, <laughs> you know, what if we had an accident with this Oh thing? my goodness. We right. With a lot here. So, wow. Um, yeah. That's amazing. Well, and it's just goes to show that, I mean, you guys are standing the test of time and willing to try new things and be innovative. That that's amazing. Good yeah. on you. Oh, it was a lot of fun. I bet. That's so cool. So, and I have to ask, being that, so you grew up in Two Rivers? I did. I went to high school at Washington High School in Two Rivers. Oh, yeah. cool. So have you ever sailed on the Badger? I have. Oh, yeah, nice. a well, times. I, hope I did when I was, I did when I was a lot younger and then um, I was on it. Mm, I'm going to say it's about eight years ago with my kids oh, where fun. we kind of did an around the lake trip and we came home on the Badger from from Ludington. So it was a Very blast. Cool. The kids had a fantastic time. They were just kind of off nice. on their own watching movies and playing games and they wanted bingo and they thought it was the greatest thing ever. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad to hear that they were some badger bingo winners that yeah. <laughs> um, there is something kind of nice for everyone that is like, especially you know, for you, like when you see or hear the badger on board, like, do you think like, oh, I know exactly what those air horns are doing or anything like that? Or do your kids even know or? Yeah, the kids, yeah, the kids know. Um, and well, at the time, I don't know, they were 12 or 13. And, you know, to some extent, it's like, oh, yeah, that's cool, Dad. Um, can we have some money to go get snacks? <laughs> so, I can see that. They probably have more appreciation for it now. I have two boys that are 20, 22 and 23. So I think they, they're, you know, oh, more fun. aware now. But, right. You know, we'll just have I a think, part I think of it. It's great. Great. No, that's that's perfect. And with all the different ships and things that you've done, do you have a favorite ship or ferry? Um, well, it's got to be the Badger. I mean, yeah. that's. I mean, just, I don't uh, want you to feel obligated to say that, no, but it's a question I, mean, I ask everyone. No, it really, it really does. I mean, you know, that's the one that's. I mean, that it's, it's part of home, right? Yeah. I mean, seeing it and the sound of it, and I'm glad they kept it going. Um. Yeah, it'd be a, a big loss, a big loss not to have it. So um, it does a lot, you know, for both communities and. Yes. And yeah, she's so iconic to both communities in so many different ways that I think it's so fascinating to highlight, you know, we're based in Michigan, obviously, but we have so many ties to Wisconsin that once I heard that they were built in two rivers, I'm like I need to, I need to know more. I need to learn more that I appreciate your your time and just sharing all of this because I never would have thought in little easy for me to say little old two rivers Wisconsin but you guys are definitely right. making an impact on a global scale yeah yeah it's been good I appreciate the time to talk about it um it's yeah a, it's a fun business yeah it's very unique indeed that and then the yeah. one other question I've asked everyone is that with the Badger celebrating 70 years of service in 2023, how does it feel to be a part of her legacy? You know, that's, that is a difficult question. It's, mm -hmm. it's something where I don't, you know, you would think that I guess because our product's been on there that long, 
that I would feel very connected to it because of that. But yeah. I don't think it's really because of that. I think it's just because that, you know, the Badger has been a part of my life, just like everybody else's, you know, sure. who's seen it and heard it. And, you know, that's really the big deal. You know, I, while, while I've been here 30 years, you know, the people that did that mm-hmm. and put that horn on that boat, um, you know, there's just, I mean, we're just grateful. You know what I mean? I think For that's sure. maybe the best way to put it as far as being connected to it. Yeah. Um, because it really, you know, doesn't feel so much like our doing in terms of current generation. We're just grateful mm-hmm. um, that the that our ancestors were really bright guys and <laughs> girls that did that. Yeah. Well, and I think that also kind of goes back to what you're saying about the quality of the brand and that, you know, it doesn't need a lot of maintenance and that you no build a really great thing that we can keep sharing today. And, and who knew back in 1953 that we'd be here 70 years later talking about how iconic this horn is for so many people. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It is cool indeed that I so appreciate your time and I'm just all that you do. (laughs) No problem. I appreciate it. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. And now a word about our partners in our port cities. If your idea of the perfect vacation is sugar sand beaches, clear blue waters along 28 miles of Lake Michigan shoreline, outdoor adventures, climbing to the top of historic lighthouses, or exploring a charming downtown, Ludington is your destination for pure Michigan fun. Ludington's unspoiled natural resources offer the quintessential up north experience, all within easy reach, located at the intersection of US 31 and US 10. No matter what you're seeking, a beach or outdoor adventure, a peaceful getaway, or just a community of friendly faces. You can find it all in Pure Ludington. As a Ludington native, I know I sound biased, but Ludington is truly an astonishing place. There's always something going on, amazing places to dine and get drinks, along with unique attractions you won't find just anywhere. Plan your visit today at pureludington.com. Manitowoc. The maritime capital of Wisconsin is the perfect vacation destination for those seeking adventure, a little relaxation, or a whole lot of fun. With sandy beaches, miles of biking and hiking trails, a real World War II submarine that you can both climb aboard and sleep on, a strong art scene, variety of breweries to explore, and array of annual events and festivals, Manitowoc offers so many unique and exciting options for visitors to add to their travel itinerary. As a frequent visitor to Manitowoc, I can attest to the thriving and charming downtown. From classic candy and ice cream parlors to outdoor music venues, there's so much to explore, experience, and enjoy in Manitowoc. I always look forward to going back. Start planning your getaway to Manitowoc, Wisconsin at visitmanitowoc.com.